everybody. How we doing? Got caffeinated? Feeling good? Nice. So I'm Anjana Vakil. Hello. Um, you can find me on Twitter at my name. And today I'd like to talk to you about immutable data structures for functional programming in JavaScript. Um, we're going to take a look at what immutable data structures are, why they're a really cool way to handle uh, the immutability that we typically use when we're doing functional programming, and how we can do that in JavaScript, because I hear you all like JavaScript. So a little about me. Um, I'm probably the only not web developer in the room. I am an engineer for Uber Research. I uh, work with them to develop a custom query language for data in the scientific research funding domain. I'm also an alum of the Recurse Center, which is a fantastic programming community in New York City. Uh, and I'm an alum, uh, I am an alum of the Outreachy program, which, if you haven't heard of it, is an amazing initiative to get more women and underrepresented folks involved in open source projects by offering paid internships at organizations like Mozilla. So I'm also a Mozilla community member and a Moz tech speaker. So I'm really happy to chat about any of those things if you want to come grab me after the talk. But um, you might know that I like functional programming. I think it rocks. Anybody else agree with me that functional programming is cool? Yeah. Yeah, so functional programming is a pretty uh, great way to avoid some of the headaches of other paradigms like imperative or object-oriented programming. In functional programming, what we typically do is um, conceive of our programs as being just pure functions. That means that they transform their inputs into outputs, and that's all they do. They don't have any side effects, things like printing to the console or mutating, uh, changing something in the global state would be side effects. Don't do any of that, none of that. So our functions become just pure data in, data out, like transformers of data. And one thing that goes hand in hand with this avoidance of side effects is using immutable data. Immutable data meaning once we've created it, it never changes. So this is a really good way to avoid accidentally changing something outside of your function. If everything's immutable, you can't change anything. So immutability is another thing that rocks. And it rocks pretty hard um, for some reasons that we'll see in a moment. But speaking of rocks, let's talk about rocks. <laughs> So this is a rock, and uh, immutability rocks in the way that rocks rock. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been going to a lot of tech conferences recently, and I have been feeling like there hasn't been enough poetry. So I'd like to read you a poem. <clears throat> Nobody sits like this rock sits. You rock, rock. The rock just sits and is. You show us how to just sit here. And that's what we need. So true. So deep. This is from, yeah, thank you, thank you. Don't thank me, thank I Heart Huckabees. Great movie, check it out, very funny. So this is really how immutable data rocks. It just sits there. It just is. Once we've created it, it never changes. And that's amazing because it helps us avoid some of the headaches of mutability. So with mutability, we uh, we have some things pretty easy, but other things become harder. And we'll see how that looks. So let's say I have an array called foo, and it's got some numbers in it. And I'm already bored. OK, let's make it more fun. Let's say I have a zoo with some animals. More fun. Um, and I decide that I want to change something up about my zoo. Maybe I want to replace that rabbit there with something a little more exotic, like an alien. So this is cool. I'm happy because I wanted a more exotic zoo. I got an alien in my zoo now. I didn't have to change anything except that one little cell in my array. That's pretty sweet. But my coworker over there was expecting zoo to be full of like earth beings, earth animals, and wasn't accounting for there being an alien in it. And it's like, who put this alien there? Now my program doesn't work anymore. Ah, who did that? So. Mutability has a couple problems. We have to manage uh, who's been changing what, when, who's been putting which animals in the zoo. We have to have a lot of overhead to manage that state. And that gives us headaches as individuals and as teams. We also get bugs in the code, because maybe I was only planning, or my, my coworker was only planning to handle 
terrestrial beings and didn't have a case of aliens accounted for, and that broke something. So these are some side effects of mutability that don't make us happy. Let's try doing things the immutable way. So in an immutable world, my array, my zoo, once I've created it, it just sits and is forever. I cannot change it. What I can do if I want a new zoo with, that's more exotic is I can make a copy that's the same size as my original array, and I can make the modification that I want, so I can put my alien there in place of the rabbit, and then I can copy over everything else in the array that didn't change. So this is pretty sweet because now my coworker is happy. They're like, woo, nothing broke in my program. It's all still Earth creatures. But I had to copy over that whole array. I had to allocate the space for that entire uh, array, even all of the stuff that didn't, changes, that didn't change. I had to copy all of that over as well. So this means that my code runs pretty slow, and it also takes up a lot of memory. It takes up a lot of space and time. The complexity on those things are bad, because copying is a waste of both time and space. It makes us sad face. We don't want that. So if we want to do immutability, we must be able to find a better way of doing that. Luckily for us, a lot of very smart folks have been thinking very hard about this problem for a while, and they've come up with some really good solutions to how we can deal with immutability efficiently. Immutable data structures. So immutable data structures is a, a term you may have heard bandied about, especially in conjunction with functional programming or perhaps also with React, where they also come in very handy. Technically, an immutable data structure is just any data structure that's like the rock. Once you've created it, it just sits and is. It never changes. Uh, but you also hear the term persistent data structures bandied about. Sometimes these are used interchangeably, although they have slightly different meanings. So if immutable data is just data that never changes, persistent data structures are ones for which we have some kind of access to old versions. So as we've been creating like, new modified versions of our data structure, we keep the old versions around. And you hear, might hear about partially persistent data structures where we can, we can like, look at the old versions, we can access them, but we can't go back and update any of them. All we can update is the most current uh, version that we have. And then you might also hear about fully persistent data structures where we can actually time travel. We can go back and update any of our past versions. Uh, and if this is starting to ring a bell, that it sounds a little bit like version control, like Git, it's sort of the same idea. So we're going to talk about these as persistent immutable data structures. They're both persistent and immutable. Let's see how this works. The, the key to all of this is that we want the old versions of our data, like my original zoo, to stay put. We want them to just sit like the rock. But we want new versions to be created efficiently. So what? magical tricks do we have to use to like, make this happen? Do we have to make invocations, do dances to the gods of space and time complexity? No. It's very simple. Trees and sharing. Isn't that sweet? These two simple concepts will get us efficient, immutable data. How? So let's talk about trees, because trees rock pretty hard as well, although, unfortunately, I don't have a poem for that. Sorry. Um, imagine that we could find a way to represent our zoo array as a tree. So one thing I could do is I could put all of my animals, all of my values, in the leaves of a tree. And I could make it so that each leaf holds one value, one animal, but they might get lonely. So let's put them with a buddy. Let's put them two by two. So each of our leaves will have two values, and we'll hope that the buddies get along and none of them eat each other. I'm looking at you, tiger, number six. Don't eat that koala. Um, and then we can connect them together with intermediate nodes and go up and up until we get a root node that connects the whole structure. And that root is now our previously array, now represented as a tree. So this is my zoo now in a tree structure. So given this type of structure, how do we update something? Given that my zoo is immutable, it can never change, how do I get a new version that has my alien in it? So here, what I need to do is take the node that contains the value I want to change. So in this case, that would be the 0, 1 node, which is on the bottom left that you're seeing. 
And I have to copy that over, changing the thing that I would like to be different. So I make a new copy where I've still got my monkey, but I've changed the rabbit to an alien. And then I need to copy any of the intermediate nodes in the tree that were pointing to the node that I changed. So I basically trace a path up towards the root of the tree, which now I've got a new root, which means a new version of the data structure. So this technique of making this update by copying the path from the leaf I changed to the root is called path copying. That's pretty cool, because now I didn't have to copy the entire array. I just had to copy the nodes on the way from the root to the leaf that I changed. So we've turned in something linear and in copying into something logarithmic. That's pretty cool. That's more performant. And the beauty of this is that all of these nodes in yellow here, so most of the tree, is shared between the two versions, between the old version and the new. So this saves me a lot of space, because I can actually reuse the parts of the original version that didn't change, whereas before I had to copy those over as well. So this means that what was before like a lot of memory consumption becomes much smaller, because I don't have to store as many copies of the things if they didn't change. That's called structural sharing, because we're sharing the structure of the tree between the two versions. So um, we've been talking about updating things, but how do we get at the values in our data structure? How do we access them? Well, it turns out that this isn't just a tree. It's a special type of tree called a TRIE tree, which was originally came from the word retrieval. So people, I guess, could pronounce it tree, but that's confusing because we also pronounce T-R-E-E, -E, tree. So we're going to call them tries, because that's sort of what it looks like. So our tree is a try. That's cool. A try is a type of tree where uh, the values, uh, the leaves hold the values of our data, as we saw, and the paths from the root to the values represent the keys that are associated, that that data is associated with. So often you see tries used for uh, storing things like words as keys. Uh, so for example, if I have the word T as one of my keys, what I do to get to the value associated with T is I traverse the tree one letter at a time. So from the root, I go to T, then I go to E, then I go to A, and I get TEA is my key, and my value there is 3. Because everything has to sound like E in this talk for some reason. Um, so this is pretty cool, but in our data structure, we weren't using words as keys. We, were, we, we just want an array type thing. We want indes in indices, right? So the insight here is that if we treat the index as a binary number, then we can pretend that that's kind of like our word, and we can descend the tree bit by bit as if each bit in our binary representation of our number is a letter. So let's see how that works. If I'm trying to get at item 5 in my array, so the animal at index 5, um, I'd convert that to binary. So that's 101. One. And then I step through that as if it was a word. I step through it letter by letter, bit by bit. So I go from the root to um, the branch. I have a choice of either 0 or 1. I go to branch 1 first. Then I go to branch 0. And then I take the thing uh, on the 1 side. So I go 1, 0, 1, down my tree, and I end up at my frog in index 5. So this is a pretty simple insight, but it ends up being incredibly powerful, because it allows us to quickly traverse uh, this, this tree structure, which lets us use that structural sharing to more efficiently represent our new copies of our immutable data structure. And importantly, we don't have to be using a binary tree, meaning we have two branches from each node. Uh, that fits pretty well on a slide, but actually what you mostly see is a 32-way branching. So in our trees that we've been looking at, we've had kind of one bit of information uh, per level, and we've been descending bit by bit. But if we had a 32-way branching tree, it would be uh, five bits of information that we'll be representing at each level. So that would look something like this. If we had a much bigger number, like 18,977, in binary, that's that, a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, this would be a really deep tree if I had to descend it one bit at a time. right? It would be like 15 levels deep. Too much, too long. So if I make more branches at each level, 
then I can chunk this up into kind of five-bit letters, as it were, and descend the tree that's now only three levels um, using the 32-way branching. So this is a, a kind of a trade-off between how deep your tree is going to be and how big the nodes are going to be. Because if I have just one bit of information at each level, then I have really small nodes. That's quick to copy over. But I have to go very, very deep down the tree for a larger array. And generally, uh, research has found that 32 tends to be a pretty good trade-off between the size of the nodes and the depth of the tree. OK, so we have just seen what's called often a bitmapped vector try, sometimes also called a bit partitioned vector try. Uh, that's just jargon. We don't need to care about that. But if you want something to Google, you can Google that. Uh, this is cool for array type things where we have an index and we want to jump to. But what about objects? We also want to be able to associate values with arbitrary keys, not just indices. So we want non integers as keys. How does that work? So if I want a version of my data structure where it's no longer an array, but it's something like a, an object where I am associating letters with each of my animals, like M for monkey, P for panda, et cetera. What I can do is I can take my keys, in this case, they're letters, and hash them to get a number that represents the key. So uh, that each key will have its own number. They won't be in order, necessarily, but that's OK. Objects don't have to be in order. And then we can use the hash of that number in binary to descend the tree as before. So if I wanted to look up the value associated with key f, I can hash f, get some number, Let's say I get five, like A, B, C, D, E, five. That would be represented in binaries 101. And again, I descend the tree as before. Here, for simplicity, just using a one bit at a time, two-way branching tree. But again, we would typically be doing this with 32 branches per level. So again, we just uh, descend the tree using the binary representation of our key. In this case, we use the hash function to transform it from some arbitrary object into a number. And we get the animal we want, in this case, our frog. Cool. So that, if you want to Google it, <laughs> the thing you could Google is a hash array mapped try. And this is a data structure um, that was sort of pioneered by Phil Bagwell. And then Rich Hickey implemented them in Clojure. And what, a lot of what I've been talking about is kind of um, inspired by, by work in languages like Clojure to implement these data structures efficiently. There's a ton of other. Uh, optimizations that are usually done on these data structures to make them super duper fast, and lots of, of details that we're not covering here. But this is the basic idea. Trees to represent our data, structural sharing so that we can reuse as much information as possible between the old versions and the new versions, and this idea of using binary representations of our uh, keys, whether indexes or or uh, hashed keys to descend the tree to find the thing we're looking for. So to recap, mutability induces headaches. It is to be avoided, especially if you're doing functional programming, where the, the, the essential idea is to not have side effects and only be uh, using pure functions that don't change anything except do the computation on their input and return a new output. Immutability, on the other hand, is great. Because when I'm using immutable data, I can't mess up my coworker's program by making the zoo that she thought was all Earth animals suddenly have an alien in it. But copying is a really bad way of handling immutable data because it's not efficient, neither with respect to time nor with space. And structural sharing, using these tree structures and or tri structures, and using structural sharing to save as much information as possible from one version to the next is a really performant way to do this. So you're probably thinking, OK, these data structures are cool, but what am I supposed to do with them? I'm not going to be like building boxes of emoji here, am I? No, you don't have to. Um, in JavaScript, there are some really great libraries out there to help you use these right off the bat. There are various solutions, but I'm going to talk about a couple of them. So one is called Mori. Mori is a, basically a port of ClojureScript by David Nolan that allows you to leverage the implementations of these data structures from ClojureScript, which is the version of Clojure that targets JavaScript, uh, from the comfort of your vanilla JavaScript. 
And it's got a bit more of a closure feel to it, a little bit more of a functional language feel. The API is functional, and we're going to see what that looks like in a moment. Um, but that's one thing that kind of sets this library apart. On the other hand, there's also immutable JS. Uh, this is a library put out by Facebook. It was created by Lee Byron. And this is a JavaScript implementation of these data structures. So it has a bit more of that native JavaScript feel to it. It doesn't have the, the kind of closure background brought in. And that means it's got a more object-oriented style API, although it is still returning new versions of data structures instead of changing um, mutable structures in place. So let's see what those look like. Uh, this is how you might use Mori to create what's called a vector. A vector is the data structure from Mori that you'd probably be using as an array type thing. So I've got a vector that I'm calling A, because it's sort of array-ish. It's got 1 and 2 in it. And then if I want to push something onto that, the function that I'd use is conj. This is from the, the closure world, lisp speak. And what I pass in to the conj function is the original copy, A, and then the thing I want to add on to the end, so in this case, 3. And you'll see that that creates a new data structure on the right. Um, these vectors, 1, 2, and 1, 2, 3, they look a little bit different than regular JavaScript arrays because they're, they're closure vectors. They're not really JavaScript arrays, although you can convert back and forth. But the point is that this conj uh, function returns a new value, which then I can catch as A2, can capture that. And I can prove to myself that my original A didn't change by using the count function to see how many things are in it. And there's only two things still in it. But I can prove to myself that my new version, A2, has the third thing by trying to access, by, by using the get function to access the item at index 2, the third thing, which it tells me is indeed 3. Cool. This is how you would do the same thing in immutable.js. Um, here you would use immutable.js.list.of, a little interesting uh, syntax there. And there it creates something that looks a bit more like a JavaScript array, although it is not a normal array. It is an immutable JS list. That I'll call A. And then if I want to add something onto a new version of A, I use this, this sort of dot method notation that we're used to. I'd say A dot push 3. But importantly, this is still not changing A. It kind of feels like it should be, but it's not. It's just returning a new value, uh, a new version of A, which I'm going to capture as A2. And I can prove it to myself that A didn't change. A dot size tells me it's still 2. And if I try to get the item at index 2 from A2, I find that it's 3, as I expected. So um, similarly for, for what are called maps, which is kind of the, the key value uh, object that we might be using, if I create an object O, which is going to be my Mori hash map data structure, I'm associating A with 1, B with 2. Again, we see that the syntax for these is a little bit different than our regular JavaScript objects because they're not regular JavaScript objects. They're super special immutable data structures. They need special syntax. So um, if I want to change the value of one of my keys, I can use this asoc function, pass in my original map O and then change the value of A to 3 in my new version O2. And again, I can prove to myself that the original didn't change by using the get function to make sure that A in the original one, zero, uh, O, is 1, and A in O2 is 3, as I would expect. And it looks quite similar in immutable.js, except the data structure is called map, not hash map. And I can pass in a little object, a little JavaScript object. And it creates me a map, O, that looks a little bit more, again, a little bit more JavaScript syntax that we're used to. This has a bit more of a, a, um, a syntax and a feel that you might be used to from JavaScript programming. I can use the set uh, method on O to create a new version where A is now 3. And I can use the get methods on my old version O and my new version O2 to prove to myself that the old one didn't change. So these are really immutable data structures. They look really weird if you try to look at them like in, the, uh, in the console just as JavaScript objects. They're really fun to kind of poke down into because they have this complicated tree structure. So I highly recommend you try out these libraries and see what works for you. I can tell you just really briefly, uh, before I run out of time here, that how they compare is basically, again, Mori is from the Clojure world, it's Clojure script. 
Immutable.js is from the JavaScript world. Um, that means the Immutable.js has this more object-oriented, you know, o.get kind of feel to it, which might be comfortable if you're used to writing JavaScript that looks like that. However, for me, I find it a little bit, it gives me a little bit of cognitive dissonance there because it looks like we're mutating things with that method, those method calls. We're not. We're not. But for me, to get more into the mindset of functional programming, I prefer the functional API of Mori because we're really getting used to the way we want to conceive of everything as pure functions that just take inputs and return outputs. We're not, uh, we don't even want to be kind of in the mindset of making changes in place to objects. There's also some um, minor performance differences between the two. Mori is a bit faster. Mutable.js is a bit smaller. Uh, but they're both great options. Try them out. Hope one of them works for you. So that's my talk. Uh, hope it's been useful. Go forth and don't mutate your data. Here's some references for you. Thanks.